Hey guys, my name is Mark from Jazz Guitar Lessons. What you've seen here is a snippet of me playing live a while over five or six years ago in a jazz club. And the form is sort of a minor blues of my composition. And in the, this video, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the coding, that spirit and the way jazz guitarists think in general. Specifically, I want to address how jazz guitarists think of accompaniment, so the comping side, how we improvise in solo, and also what's the rhythmic influence and how jazz guitarists think in terms of rhythms to make these these performances happen live. So case in point, that that's an anecdote of me. It's me playing live. It was my own record launch. I was doing my, my second album, Second Chances, uh, released in 2018. It's a studio record and we did a live thing. And I came to believe that a lot of people that come across jazz don't necessarily know how to address it or how to practice or what, what's the whole like paradigm of a jazz guitar jazz guitar player taking a solo. So we'll just dig into these topics in this video. So let's first discuss the idea of comping. Comping is a short for accompaniment. And one thing I like to think about is comping is more like complementing. And what do we comp for? Typically it's a solo. So in the case of this video example here, I was comping for Frank and Frank was taking a solo on that form. So the role of the jazz guitarist within the band is to produce a sound that we would typically expect a piano player to do, right? So it means we have these chord shapes and there's a chord harmonic structure and we provide support for this. So the comping is an essential part of jazz music, although there are a lot of straight ahead records without the presence of a comping instrument, which could mean, hey, it's a duet between a bass player and a sax player, there's no really comping instrument. But in that realm, typically both instruments are both comping at the same time while they take the solos. It takes a deep level of mastery as it's easier to solo when you hear the chords. So the jazz guitarist's role is to make the chords heard by using the, strong, the song structure. One of the biggies in the paradigm shift for comping is learning some of these sounds. So I may elect to play a minor nine or I may look at playing altered dominance. So if it says G7, I'll play G7 flat nine, even if no one told me so, because I know that thing is gonna resolve somewhere else. So it takes not only a knowledge of the shapes, but it takes a knowledge of the context, context to make sure that the chords go where they're supposed to go. And that I, as an accompanying instrument, I'm not getting in the solo's way. I wanna complement the solo and help it. Which brings me to my last point, which is lots of guitarists come from the world of either blues comping or rock, or it can be folk, and typically there will be a set pattern of strumming. It could be a strumming thing, it could be a, a riff if you're playing rock or blues, it could be um, more of a thing of a certain chord shape if you're playing funk. In jazz, the boundaries are a bit larger in that I need to understand the harmonic structure and any version of that chord, say it's an E minor chord, any version of that chord that I know is up for grabs during my comping. So I could comp on E minor without repeating myself for several seconds because I, I know what it sounds like and I'm gonna try to pick the voicings and the rhythms to really complement what's happening. So it means that I have to have an eye here inside, but an eye outside as the same time. Well, let's say an ear inside and an ear outside, which is a tremendously difficult thing to do. I can appreciate how, uh, say, very good piano players accompany operas or choirs or whatever, they need to do both their job and listening to the other ones to make sure they're on par, right? And so the biggie here, the big paradigm shift, is learning the vocabulary of chords is only part of the game. Once that's done, then the application in real time has to be about complementing, making sure I'm in time, making sure it's swinging hard, but also making sure that I'm making the soloist sound good because of the, because of the comping ideas I bring in. Now let's talk about soloing. In jazz, we have our lingo, we'll say improv, which is not improv theater, or we'll say blow. When people say blow on the changes, it's a really horn thing, like a trumpet or a sax will blow on the changes. Um, so here's the mindset for a jazz guitarist. Pretty much the same mindset as a horn player would have. And I would like to distinguish this thing from, uh, say, a rock or blues guitarist, because there is ne not necessarily a fixed scale or fixed pattern that will be used throughout the solo. So having a jazz guitarist, I think the melodic lines will be closer to what a saxophone would do or a piano or a trumpet would do in the jazz context than 
a jazz a guitarist of another genre. So I think it's easier to compare a jazz trumpet player to a jazz guitarist in types of line they play. That's closer than a jazz guitarist in a, and a metal guitarist, right? The sort of melodic ideas and intervals and rhythms are different. So that's a piece about starting to improvise in the jazz genre. So some of the most common techniques you will find online and off, of course, of course is to start with scales and chords. So if I have a C major chord of sorts, we will get taught in a book that, well, this is the sound right now of this chord, and what is okay to play, what fits in the grammar of chords is to play, well, a scale, so C major scale would be up for grabs for sure. And then the C major seven arpeggio or variations thereof. That's really the start of it. And although this is beautiful, this is really just the entry point into getting the grammar correct for improvising jazz lines. So once a jazz guitarist has been taught to play within the chord sequence, so say it's a C major, I'm gonna play in C major scale and C major arpeggio, and I have a, a playground in which I can play these ideas, and then the chord changes to something else, say it's an A flat minor, and then I get to play within that scale or that chord of the next thing. Once that's done, uh, a good place to start is start to adding chromaticism. And adding chromatic notes means that we get to play outside note of the scales, but all the while I have an aim to resolve. So don't, <laughs> Uh, don't mind me here for a second. If you're trying to just learn one scale per chord and say, well, it's my pentatonic and I'm just going to put every note in between right here it is. And then I'm going to go. It's going to sound terrible because there's no aim in doing that. So typically chromatic notes are like a Tarzan going from one, one chord, one rope to the, the next rope in order to get somewhere. So chromatic notes can be weaved into arpeggios uh, and scales. For instance, if I have uh, an arpeggio of a G, I can go uh, G7, for instance. I can slide in chromatically, and then I may descend the scale chromatically as well from there. And you see that the importance of rhythm here is a line is only a line because of the context of that chromatic thing, which makes me land where I wanted to land, which brings me to my next topic. So after a beginning, jazz guitarist has an idea of the playground for each chord that are separate, that's able to use scales and arpeggios and perhaps a bit of chromaticism, the next really good place to be is to start to, start to think of soloing on chord changes. So while a song passes by, let's say we have Stella by Starlight, there's a whole bunch of chords passing by, and my idea is, yes, to build good ideas for each individual chords, but to connect, connect these ideas seamlessly in making the changes. And one of the best ways to solo on chord changes is with the method of target notes. My favorite target note? No, it's not the root or the base of the chord. It's really the third degree of the chord. So three letters up. If I go C major, I go C, D, E. And if I can attempt to have that note within my line, it's going to sound like this chord is sounding especially if I can play the arpeggio and the scale right before or after. So by using arpeggios, scales, chromatic notes, and then target notes and weaving in solos like this, then a jazz guitarist thinks of what to say. Now we're still talking about soloing and improv. If I could cut this into, this is part two. Part one is grammar, vocabulary, scales, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the part two, the more philosophical part is how a jazz guitarist thinks, thinks or how I, I was thinking in this example introduction is I'm thinking about the next thing to say. And that thinking takes place for me and for, I guess, a lot of different jazz players from an oral perspective, A-U-R-A-L. So my next idea comes to me in the form of sound and whatever I have in my head, I'm attempting to put it on the instrument. Personally, I would say that it is a crapshoot. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a, a coin toss maybe 50% of the time, probably less, I'm able to execute that thing which I heard on my instrument and resolve it properly. And that inspiration can then be caught up by my mental, mental side that will go, okay, you're trying to say this, you heard that line, but then my fingers can be guided towards things that are grammatically correct to make these changes because I have rehearsed those. I have drilled them and drilled licks and stuff, but when I'm improvising, I'm thinking of things to say almost I'm saying a speech, rather than trying to have a speech that's all grammatically correct. That's a big paradigm shift because learning language is just one part of it. The other part of it is, okay, now that you can play bop, 
like learn all the bebop licks, learn all the Charlie Parker, practice scales madly for like 10 years. Okay, now what? Well, the now what is uh, personally what I'm really interested in. So let's move on to the next section. All right, a really important section, maybe underrated and not talked about enough, is the rhythms. The rhythms aspect of jazz guitar and of jazz in general is so significant it it cannot be I cannot say it often enough in, in the teaching that this is what's going to make or break a solo. If I have the most beautiful comping chords and the most beautiful intention accompaniments or the most beautiful lines in my solo and I perfectly hear and everything, if that is not done in strict time and good swinging feeling rhythm, it's going to sound bad anyways. So that's how we can say that the rhythm aspect takes precedence over the contents almost to a point where certain improvisers <laughs> Yeah, Mike Brecker. No choices were sort of beyond him. It was more about the energy and where the solo went, right? So this whole energy thing comes from the rhythm. So uh, here's a few examples of swing. So you'll have, uh, assuming we're doing a blues in the key of B flat, a four on the floor swing is typically where jazz players will start. So something like this, three, four, right? Just outlining that we have a quarter note. And then you'll start to hear sort of syncopations like this. One, two, three, four, basic Charleston rhythm. really important things derived from the Charleston, which has uh, variations basically over every beat and other ramifications of the Charleston figure. So uh, swinging is certainly very important in American uh, jazz and music. And don't <laughs> humor me for a second. When I mean swing, also means that, that say Brazilian music also has a swing, even though it's not swing shuffled eights, ting ticketing, it is taka taka ting ticketing, it's straight eights but there's a swing to it, which is sort of the feel or the forward motion, which is accomplished by how uh, musicians lay on the beat. Are they laying like right on, on it, on top of it, or is it a bit laid back, etc.? So that's very hard to describe in the video. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me and my French accent. And um, syncopation is really important. Also, polyrhythms is a feature of music in which you will hear a jazz player execute lines which in a really straight ahead form, say a bop thing, would be mostly consisting of eight notes, right? So if I'm playing my B flat blues again, like this, if I play eight notes, I go. So that's just an example of how we could play on changes, but then players may fall into started to play triplets. I think I played a, a bunch of triplets, like something like that. So triplets, 16th notes, uh, eighth notes are, are the basic currency of jazz. It's like, the ch it's like the penny of jazz. But since there is a lot of different rhythmic figures, jazz players will start to play push and pull with the rhythm to make them uh, to, for effect, for emotional effect. So maybe there's a line that starts with an eighth note, but then with, goes with quarter triplets wind ups with eight note triplets and finishes with a few eight notes and quarter notes. That's all depending on how the player feels naturally. So one of the best ways to improve rhythmic accuracy. Yeah, I know. Accuracy. Yeah, I know. Aww. I'm gonna hear, ah, uh, yeah, the famous, the infamous metronome. You gotta make that click. You gotta put it a certain uh, rhythm and then play in time with it. Whether it's the comping, it's a scale, or it's target notes or tunes, etc. It is crucial to have a sense of Time alignment, time alignment, because this is the glue of how jazz guitarists think. If I'm playing with a band, a bass player and a drummer, I'm trying to connect with those. And these guys have, especially in the video and the introduction, they have a, a perception of the time, and I'm trying to align with it. Whether I'm trying to play lines with them or comp with them, there is a way that has to be very deliberate as far as rhythm placement. So that's a complete paradigm shift. If we look at rhythms, say you play in a rock band or blues band, Typically, the rhythm is repeated and it's sort of the same rhythm and then there's not much to do. In jazz, we have a lot of freedom as far as what rhythms to use, both in comping, 
and improv because the comping is also improvised. The comping is ad lib, more or less. So that's why having solid rhythms, using the metronome, counting all the subdivisions, one and two and two and three, uh, one at, uh, you know, all those, the sixteenths, it's really important to count well and to slow down to make rhythms very accurate, precise, and then to make make way for the jazz guitar's ideas, what's in their mind to come out in sort of a proper aligned format to connect with the other uh, other musicians in the audience. All right, how jazz guitarists practice. This is my favorite section. I don't want to talk too much about this because it varies from person to person and from time to time. So when I first started practicing jazz guitar, I was fond of attempting to learn the music while reading the music, learning a whole bunch of hip chords and doing a lot of technical proficiency drills, which has migrated over time to playing things that are way more applicable. And that's would say I would say that's been the bulk of my practice for the past 10, 15 years, which is, hey, where does this take place? Is this taking place somewhere on a chord progression on a form or a song I can reuse so that I have context? And then in an effort to make the things I practice more useful, I would try to find more context for the same ideas. Right, so not so would be playing the same idea over different contexts, and sometimes I guess people want to do vice versa. They want to look at one tune and plug fifty licks on it. My approach would be to learn one lick and place it in fifty tunes. If you see what I'm saying, so context is really important as far as that, and the focus, of course, making a practice session deliberate in executing ideas and having an aim, not necessarily a technical aim like a BPM. Uh, target, but meaning achieving one precise constraint in improvisation drills, as I mentioned earlier, which is scales and arpeggio stuff, but also in improvisation outcome. Like I want to improvise a free solo, but I want to use that one constraint. So I want to play just Charleston. I want to play just this, just that. And the more focused and deliberate I am, the more focus it takes me, but also the more results I can get from my practice sessions. If I may suggest a practice routine, you're just getting into jazz, I would say the best route that my students take now, my, all my students, is to use the seven step process. It's found at jazzguitarlessons.net slash process for absolutely zero dollars. It's completely free. And you can also find a seven step crash course right now, which I'm going to update very soon on the fellowship link in description. And the process is basically to take a song through different segments. So divide and conquer. I'm going to take Autumn Leaves or Blue Bassa or Blues and B flat or whatever standard. And I'm going to replicate the same steps, the same assignments over those so that I can start to gain traction on that. The first five steps are basically that. It's learning to comp, learning the melody or chord melody and making a minimal solo. And after I can do that on one song, put it in the vault, keep reviewing it and tackle another one, another one, another one until you have five to ten songs. Once that practice threshold is reached, you can see the guide in the description in the process and look at step six and seven, uh, just to make sure that you build some sort of vocabulary. What not to do, a practice schedule, 15 minutes scales, 15 minutes arpeggios, doing this, yeah, that's not gonna work. Uh, I wanna spend 15 minutes learning new voicings. Unless it's applied to a tune, you won't apply it to the tune. And also while you start to learn tunes, you will forget tunes faster than you learn them. So my whole approach, my suggestion, from a very humble 15-year experience teaching online professional jazz guitarist is play the tunes, play on the tunes, play within the tunes, use a few chords, progressions from a single tune, and rehearse, rehearse, rehearse until your comping is cool, until you can play lines, and until you can play in time, increase your tempo, and repeat over and more and more songs, and then like, oh, look at that, I'm starting to have chops, then play with some people. You'll be humbled. Go to a jam and call Stella by Starlight or all the things you are and go, oh, there's so many things I can't do. I thought I could do because in the comfort of my practice room, I play all these scales. But when I get on stage, um, I'm not just going to play a scale, right? Well, I get on stage playing all the things you are. I'm not doing. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's important to practice technique and to be able to execute these things. But as I found in my years of teaching, if we start by doing this scale work and arpeggio work as a prerequisite, often we wind up covering tunes very badly or not at all. And I encounter a record amount of individuals going, Mark, I've been practicing jazz five years. Cool, play me a tune. They can't, they can't play a tune. 
So don't be that guy or be that guy. We'll give him a call, you can join the program and we'll solve your problem. See the link in the description. Hey guys, that's it for this video. So to summarize how jazz guitarists think about comping, about improv is what we talked about, about rhythms and also about practicing. I hope you've enjoyed. Leave me a comment to ask any questions about the content that you might have here. And please like and subscribe and share this video with anyone you think might like it. Just to reiterate, we have a fellowship group which is fully free, 100% free forever. And at the time of filming this, it has 1600 jazz guitarists the world around. It's the best jazz guitar community. And this is where you get to hang out with me and thousands of students to ask your questions, to post your videos. I'm posting a new standard each week, each week, yeah, for 50 weeks this year in 2024. So if you like that, just come on board. It's totally free and we'll have a blast. You can learn jazz guitar, ask your questions. And I'm just going to tell you good luck to your success. Practice hard, apply all the stuff from this video, and I'll see you in the next videos. Take care. Thank you.